Hello, and welcome to Book Break for Greece Public Library. I'm Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate our Pints and Prose book discussion group, and I am joined, as always, by my favorite reader, Claire. Hello, everyone. I'm Claire. I moderate As the Page Turns and also our historical group on Facebook. Excellent. And today we are just going to be bringing you a roundup of some of the books we've been reading. We haven't done this. We were just chatting in a really long time. Yeah, so no particular theme here. Mm -hmm. Just yep. kind of like what we've been up to. Yeah, just a bunch of books. Yeah. On no particular theme. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, do you want to kick us off, Claire? Sure. The, the funny thing is, is I'll kick us off with this first one. It's called Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan. And the funny thing is, is this is one of those ones where I put on hold, totally don't remember putting it on hold. And when I got it, I'm like, what? What is this? You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's short, so I can definitely read it. But um, this one, actually, I would consider a novella. And it is set in 1985 in a small Irish town. Um, and I thought this would be appropriate since we're right before St. Patrick's Day. There you go. But... Um, it's, it's leading up right before Christmas. So we have our main character is Bill Furlong. He is a father of five daughters, happily married. He is a hardworking man. He has like a coal and, you know, energy type business where mm -hmm. he delivers to all the different people in their community. Um, his mother was an unwed mother. He still does not know who his father is, which kind of bothers him. Um... But anyway, he makes a delivery to the convent in the area and tries to get into the coal bin, and there is a young girl that has been locked in there. So he knows this is not right. He's trying to figure out the mystery. Um, and then the more he starts to discover, after you know he's gotten her back into the convent, they kind of like push him along like, oh, oh, nothing to see here, you know, type of thing. So he goes home and tries to talk to his wife and different people, and he finds that, you know, the church has such a stronghold on the whole community, um, and his daughters are all at the Catholic school, which is next door. It's not actually in the convent, but it's very closely associated with it. Um, so he devises, like, a plot to figure out what is going on, and... Um, Sure enough, he goes back again, and it's right before Christmas, finds another girl, not the same one, and mm. decides that he is going to bring her home because he just feels this is inhumane. Um, rumors have gone around that this is actually a home for unwed mothers, and they pretty much have to work off their burden to society. Um, so this ended up being a big scandal in Ireland mm -hmm. with uh, the Magdalene houses, a lot of it, uh, the last one closed, I believe, in the late 1990s. It was far later. Yeah, than far later than been. you would yeah. think or should have. So even though it was a very small little book, it kind of packs an emotional wallop. And mm. particularly for our main character, because he is thinking of it, not just a perspective of this young girl, but also like what would have happened to his mother, because the person that his mother worked for actually did not throw her out and allowed her to raise him in the house and he had little chores and she helped educate him and everything which is one of the reasons he became like a successful person in the community not that he was rich or anything but you know sure he had a solid family yeah. um and then the fact that he has five daughters and he thinks what if it could have been one of them so yeah um just a little, I wouldn't say it was a happy Christmas story. I mean, it does end hopefully, but mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there's a lot of messages there. Mm -hmm. um, and especially in today's climate, still still timely. Yeah. So Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. That's always fun, though, when like a mystery hold pops up. Really? Yeah, because I had no idea what it was about. I was just like, why? Why did yeah. I do this? I don't even recognize the cover, which was the horrible <laughs> part. So, yeah. But it sounds like it ended up being a worthwhile read. Yes. And I, I mean, it was like you could read it all in one sitting. Yeah. And then think about it for a little bit. Nice. So, yeah. Very cool. That's my first one. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with... This one first. So my first book is going to be Velvet Was the Night by Silvia Moreno-Garcia. So Silvia Moreno-Garcia Moreno um, 
you may or may not recall, was the author of Mexican Gothic, which I talked about. Oh, God, it's been a while now. It's like a year and a half. We've been doing this for so long. I know. Um, that kind of freaked me out a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but that was one of my favorite books that I read. It must have been 2020. Yeah. Um, so this was her next book after Mexican Gothic. Um, it is set in Mexico City in the 1970s, and it's a very different feel to Mexican Gothic. So it's not a horror. This is more like a noir set in the 1970s. So our main characters are Maite, who is a secretary. She has kind of a stifled life. Um, she goes to work. She comes home. She does collect records, and she's obsessed with, um, like, romantic comics. Hmm. Um, so she's got, you know, some interests, but she just, she doesn't have anything really fulfilling in her life. Um, and her across-the-way neighbor, Lorena, asks her to house-sit for her for a couple of days and, like, feed her cat, um, and then disappears. So this kind of throws Maite into the middle of a little bit of a mystery. She doesn't know what happened to Lorena, and people have started coming to look for her. Um, and our other main character is Elvis, which is, we are given to understand, a pseudonym. He works um, kind of off the books for the government in kind of an anti-communist gang. Oh. Like, these guys are just kind of... Um, sent in to like infiltrate student groups and they show up during protests and bash heads like he's kind of a a goon yeah, for hire sounds like it. um but he also has you know some other interests outside of that he, he just kind of fell into this position where he is but his boss has tasked him to find Lorena to find this missing woman um so that kind of kicks off our whole mystery. So then we've got um, kind of these two parallel tracks um, all surrounding Lorena and what happened to Lorena and where did she go. Um, so I don't want to get too much into the mystery part of it, but we've got hitmen and G-men and Russian spies oh boy. and people running around and, you know, chaos everywhere. Um, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and I learned quite a bit about Mexican history, which I am not familiar with whatsoever, and kind of the communist um, protests and uprisings that happened, especially centered, centered around students okay. in the 70s. So it was fun. Like I said, totally different feel than Mexican Gothic, um, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that one sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, my next one, I'm going to give myself an award. <laughs> Louise Penny, Still Life. This <laughs> one was on my to-be-read list since 2014. So yay to me for, for knocking one off. <laughs> um, a lot of people love this series. Mm -hmm. Louise Penny, this is the Armand Gamache mm -hmm. series. It's uh, set in Quebec, and he is a detective and... Kind of a, a cozy mystery with a little bit of slow burn and kind of a psychological viewpoint to it as well. So to start off, this particular mystery, we have a teacher in the community. I believe she's in her 70s, very well loved. They have an art show every year, and this is the first time she's ever entered the art show. Um, when she presents it to the board, they're all astounded because it's... Like, at first, they think it's awful, um, but then they decide to, to go ahead and put it in this juried art show, and um, the night before, I believe she's supposed to have everyone over to her house for a celebration and big reveal, she is found dead in the woods um, with a hunting arrow. Mm -hmm. Well, the arrow wasn't there, but they figure it was a hunting arrow. So at first, the synopsis is kind of like, well, this is probably a hunting accident that went astray. But then we have um, Armand Garmash come, and the more he starts looking at it, he realizes that is not the case. So he starts delving into the secrets of everyone in this little town. Um, if you like something like I Love Vera, this I, I instantly just gravitated towards this. And although it took me a little bit to get 
kind of going. Mm-hmm. Once I got into it and realized who all the people were and everything, I you know I read it pretty quickly, and I definitely would like to read more in this series. Um, I've heard they get better as they go along. Hmm. So, and I think I read somewhere that they're going to be using this for like an Amazon Prime series, but I couldn't ascertain that for a fact. I mean, I would not be shocked. No, <laughs> It is no. a very well-loved series. There was an older version of this that didn't get very great reviews, like an older TV ver- from like the hmm. early 2000s okay. or something, but I think this is a new development, but I don't want to spread too many rumors. So, <laughs> But anyway, um, I really like this. The community is the Three Pines, uh, definitely a lot of little families, mm-hmm. red herrings here and mm-hmm. there, um, where you think you're going down a path to know the killer, and then, nope, nope, not it, not it. So, yeah. um, But I didn't figure it out, so that was good. So I also just finished this book, unrelatedly, <laughs> um, and I listened to it on audio, and it's hysterical. So the book came out in, like, 2005, I think. Yeah, this is the It's first older, one. Um, but what they did with the audio, I I borrowed it on Libby, but they literally like just ripped the CDs from the book on CD. So you get like the, <laughs> this book continued on disc four. <laughs> Still Life by Louise Penny, disc four. <laughs> like all of the transitions is hysterical. I, I cracked up. Um, and it, it definitely struck me as like, And that might have been part of it, the audio production of it, but it definitely struck me as like a very old school mystery. Like you could have seen it on like the PBS mystery. Yeah, this definitely could have been a Brit Box, you Mm -hmm. know, kind of production type of thing. So, yeah. yeah. It was very comforting in that way, I think. I'm not sure I'm going to continue with the series, but it was interesting. Yeah, I think I will. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Um, then I will go with my kind of mystery, although mine's more thrillery than this one, which is The Disappearing Act by Katherine Stedman. So this is another um, book by an author that I've talked about previously. The book that I talked about of hers before was Something in the Water. Ah, uh, yes. We both read that one. Yes. Yeah. Which is like roller coaster bonkers right. like crazy, crazy pants <laughs> thriller um and this one is a little bit more restrained <laughs> a little bit um so our premise is mia elliott is our main character she's an actress based out of the uk um she has just had a pretty awful breakup with her boyfriend who is also an actor um so she's not in a great place emotionally mm-hmm. and she is flying to la for pilot season Um, So she has a bunch of auditions booked and all kinds of meetings in L.A. And she's using it just as kind of a way to escape from everything that's going on in England, right? So while she's at one of these auditions, like these big cattle call auditions, she meets another actress named Emily. And um, she does a small favor for Emily, um, while they are waiting for their turns to audition. And then Emily disappears. You have two disappearing people books. Uh, Oh, yeah, I guess I do. (laughs) I guess I do. Um, And Mia turns out to have been one of the last people, possibly, to have seen Emily before her disappearance. So she's kind of trying to figure out what's going on, trying to find this woman, and then... Surprise, a woman turns up who claims to be Emily, but is maybe not the same person. Oh. Right. So chaos ensues, (laughs) as it does with Catherine Stedman. Um, So we do get uh, a lot of the same kind of roller coaster. Like, things just happen. Like, the plot moves in these books. (laughs) It moves. Um, And there's not quite so much suspension of disbelief required as in something in the water, I think. Although there are still some things where you're like, well, that might have, that might not have worked out quite like that in real life. Um, But it was highly entertaining, really moves quickly. And the other thing that I really 
found fascinating about this book was there's a ton of behind the scenes like Hollywood oh, okay. stuff. That would so be fun. like yeah. how these big cattle call auditions work and how pilot season works and how you actually like have a career as a working actor. So I found all of that really interesting. And the author, Catherine Stedman, is actually an actress. Like she is an actress in her day job and apparently writes these crazy train books in her spare time. And she also does the audio narration oh, wow. for her own books. Okay. Um, which is Did you do that one on fun. audio? I did. Yeah. I did. Um, so she read it. It's so much fun. Like you will not be bored with yeah. one of these books and you just, you don't think about it super close. Just, just let it, let, just it, let it take you on a ride. <laughs> Sounds like a good one for spring break. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Her books are, I think I talked about them for Beach Read or yeah. Hammock Read. Right. And they're perfect vacation books. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I might have to add that one to my list mm-hmm. too. So I'm going with cold, comforting, and very short this time. (laughs) So my last book is called um, Love and Saffron. And the the main thing that this reminds me of is 84 Charing Cross Road. Okay. Because it's all written in letters back and forth. It's set in the 1960s. Yes, early early 60s. -hmm. And what we have is um, a character, Joan... She's 27. She still lives with her mom. She is trying to start a career in, like, newspaper writing. So she sends a fan letter to someone she found in one of her mother's magazines. And and that is 59-year-old Imogen Fortier, who, who lives on an island off of the coast of Seattle, like Washington. Mm, okay. And um, does a lot of, like, hunting elk and digging for clams and so oh forth so she's into like food from the source type mm-hmm. of thing so um joan sends her the fan letter and also a little packet of saffron and says since you live on the coast i thought you would like to try this it'd be great with like the mussels or whatever mm-hmm. so um this burgeoning like friendship it actually starts opening kind of doors and exploration for both of them Hmm. even with the age difference like so imogen does decide to use it she and her husband um start doing these things and he she finds out that he actually likes to cook and is in the kitchen and was overseas in the war in paris but he never talked about anything Hmm. with her because like most men, he just kind of mm-hmm. cl- put that in a little room and closed yeah. that door. Um, so it begins to bring them a little bit closer mm-hmm. in that respect, and you find out more about each other. And meanwhile, Joan has a friend who is Mexican, and in California at that time, like we're still talking about where that would be considered a mixed marriage, mm-hmm. so she was very uncomfortable sharing that kind of relationship with someone else even though she considered it a friendship but it did move on Um, but she started to go to some authentic places so it's a lot about food and being a foodie I absolutely adored that aspect of it and also the friendship and of course you have some things in both of their lives that you know happen that are kind of you know tragic so um, I don't want to give too much of it away because you mm-hmm. learn about these people and you start to care about them, and I don't want to like throw in all the spoilers <laughs> right now. Right, but um, but I thought it was really good. The one thing I will say is uh, the older lady and her husband do go to Paris, so Aww, that was like nice. a life changing for them. They eventually Aww. do go on this huge trip. Um, so yeah, it was really good. Nice. So if you like eighty four Charing Cross Road, I'd highly recommend this, or just like novels of food friendship Mm -hmm. you know and love that kind of letter back and forth style oh and the other thing is they bring in like things that happened in that era like the cuban missile crisis Mm -hmm. and when kennedy was assassinated and how it deeply affected these people um when something like that happened you kind of wish we had the same respect and just kind of 
I don't know, normalcy in our yeah. news nowadays. You know, uh, it was a different it was a different time. Mm-hmm. So for sure, yeah, but very good. Liked nice. It. Well, I also then have kind of a heartwarming book as my last one, so that works out nicely. Yeah. Uh, which is the Ten Thousand Doors of January by Alex Harrow, and this one is um, fantasy, kind of fantasy light. Um, I would say, and I would recommend for fans of Emily Morgenstern, um, who wrote The Night Circus Mm -hmm. and her new one, The Starless Sea. Um, So this had some of the same sort of flavor to it. Uh, So our main character is January Scholar. January is um, a teenager. She's like 14, maybe 14, 15. Um, She is... Not quite an orphan. Um, Her father works for Mr. Locke, who is extremely wealthy, um, and January lives in Mr. Locke's giant house in Vermont, up in New England somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, And she is also mixed race. Um, So that kind of comes up. So she's got some isolation in a bunch of different ways. So her father travels quite a bit for Mr. Locke. So he's hardly ever home. So she's just in kind of this big house by herself. Um, She doesn't really belong with Mr. Locke. She's not actually his child. She herself, even though Mr. Locke um, cares for her well and provides for her, she herself um, and her father are not wealthy by any means. Um, There's no one who looks like her anywhere around her. Mm -hmm. Um, She has governesses who she doesn't really get along with. Um, So she's just kind of the odd child out, right? Um, And she finds one day in Lockhouse a mysterious book. And this book kind of starts an adventure because then she also finds a mysterious door. Um, And this book talks about doors between worlds okay and she finds a door that opens into another world and that kind of kicks off our whole um action so apparently there's a whole fantasy genre of portal books which i had never heard of as a thing but then as i was reading up about this book they were like ah another portal book and i was like oh that's apparently a thing (laughs) So if you're familiar with that, this is one of them. You're a Um, portal person. Indeed. Um, So there is quite a bit of adventure. Um, January is, you know, tromping around all over the place, looking for doors and going through doors and ending up in new places. Um, It is in some places kind of bittersweet, um, but still on the like heartwarming end um january herself is a pretty appealing character um she is feisty um and like she's ready to go out and take care of herself sometimes i needed the dime to fall a little bit quicker for miss january (laughs) like there were things that clearly you were like the author was leading you up to figure out or for her to figure out oh, this person has been doing this thing the whole time. You're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> like, <laughs> we got it. <laughs> so that was occasionally a little frustrating and probably the only thing that kept me from really giving this book like a full five stars. Okay. Um, but it was still very entertaining. It's, um, you know, just kind of a, a warm-hearted romp through fantasy land. Nice. Yeah. Fantasy light, as you say. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Okay. So that's what we've got. That's what we've been reading. Um, so let us know what you've been reading. Absolutely. Um, and if you've read any of the books that we talked about today, tell us what you thought. Um, and, yeah, if you have yeah, any suggestions. Let, let us know. Should we continue on with Louise mm. Penny? Uh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm always up for another opinion. Absolutely. Um, And then we will be back at the beginning of April. Sounds good. Hopefully it'll be spring by then. Uh, We can only hope. Yes, we can. (laughs) All right. Thanks, everyone. And we will see you next time. Have a good one.